we are um, really excited to be here this morning. Uh, on this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I'm the Dean of Student Success for Yorkville University and Toronto Film School. And on behalf of the whole Student Success Unit, I want to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert session. Uh, if you're new, welcome. We do this every Friday at this time. If you are a repeat and attendee, thanks for coming back. Um, so every Friday at this time, we are thrilled to welcome an expert from within our Yorkville TFS family uh, and community and our experts talk about a topic for a few minutes and then we open the floor to questions. Uh, for your questions, please make sure that you use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. That's what we'll be paying attention to and um, I'll start uh, getting the questions over to our expert after she's had a chance to uh, present to us this morning. So on that note, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Erica Franken, whose topic speaking to us today on building emotional resilience in difficult conversations. Uh, Erica is a conflict management practitioner specializing in inner conflict. She's also a Yorkville University professor, so we're very happy that she found time today uh, to come and talk to us. Uh, Erica is the founder of Us Underneath and a contributing member of the board of directors for the Alternative Dis Dispute Resolution Institute here in British Columbia. Erica is passionate about authenticity, uh, connection, and how we can utilize conflict to live a life more true to who we are. And I know she's going to give us some wonderful information this morning. So Erica, over to you. Thank you, Deirdre. So I'm going to share my screen to just get us started. So give me one second. It's great to be here. So hopefully you can see that. Great. So this is a little blurry showing up on the screen, but if you can get a sort of a feel of what this looks like, it's a bunch of squiggles with a little bit of what looks like chaos. And it says what I want to say. And what it translates to is through this little door, there might be a few things, maybe one of a hundred of those things that says what I actually said. So if you can relate to this, you're in the right webinar. <laughs> I know I can relate to it. Um, so this webinar is going to talk about building emotional resilience in difficult conversations. And the goal of it is to align ourselves with more peace and confidence in doing so. And one of the reasons why I became interested in this work is because I felt like, you know, throughout my life and my days, I was encountering on the spectrum conflict any time of the day, any which way, right? If we can think of conflict along the spectrum of extreme or even not invisible, it's often there. And when we can start to feel ourselves shifting our personalities or getting uncomfortable or feeling like we're adjusting our sense of self in our interactions, we might be able to detect that there is a conflict of some kind there. And so what we're looking to today is how we can build resilience so that we can on a consistent basis, as much as possible, feel like we are ourselves peacefully, harmoniously, and confidently, whether we're in a conflict or not. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and just ask point blank, what is emotional resilience? I mean, what even is that? Um, you know, I, it's relatively, I wouldn't say a new term, but it's a term that's not used commonly. So my friend Colin is the founder of Stillness Labs. Um, he's a breathwork facilitator as well as a mindfulness facilitator and I believe he was also a practicing monk for seven years. So he had some experience with this idea. And he says that being emotional resilience is actually being with your emotions without being in conflict with them. So I'll say that again, being with your emotions without being in conflict with them. That means a few things. It might mean that we allow them to be if you can think of them as a wave in an ocean coming and going, you know, we don't need to attach our identity to them. We can allow them to just be. Um, my sort of personal take on that and, and how I experience emotional resilience myself is thinking of it as a rubber band. So I have two bands with me here. So I'll put one up to the screen. One's very little and tiny and blue. And the other one is red or sorry yellow and thick and strong so when i think of having emotional resilience it might look more like this right so you can see this thick band 
gives me lots of bandwidth. I can stretch it. I can, I can be, it can be malleable. It can be flexible and it's not going to snap. I'll know well before it snaps that it's fine. This band though, being the smaller blue one, sure it has bandwidth, but it doesn't have as much capacity to sustain the bandwidth. So it's much more likely to snap and probably quicker. So when you're looking at these two options for what you want your emotional resilience to look like, which one do you want? For me, I know I want this one, but that takes some practice. So what do we do? The first thing is to know how we're having a difficult conversation. I mean, what, what is having a difficult conversation? Some might argue that all conversations are difficult. Um, some might argue that, no, you know, I, I had a conflict this afternoon, I mean, it was fine, everyone was cool, we got through it. It's different for everyone. Um, and so what we're interested in today is what is a, a difficult conversation for you? And the way we'll know that is actually with our bodies communicating to us. So intellectually, we might be able to look on paper what might be a difficult conversation. We might be able to theorize about what might be a difficult conversation. But the best way to know is to tap into what your body is telling you in the moment. If you can start to feel like your heart is shrinking, these are visceral physiological um, experiences that the Heart Math Institute can point to and, and has pointed to actually when we're having um, what can come close to an amygdala hijack. So we have a physiological response in conflict. So examples would be, is our heart feeling like it shrinks? Are we feeling ourselves tense up? Are we getting at that squiggly feeling in our gut? Are we shifting? Are we wanting to like pull our arms in or keep ourselves safe? Um, whatever it is, and you'll have your own unique response, you might take that, um, that note from your body that you're in a difficult, whether it's conversation, experience, scenario, whatever. I'm gonna to move to the next slide to point more specifically to what that looks like. Um, when I mentioned the amygdala hijack, that's an, a, a very extreme version of what we might find ourselves in when we are feeling threatened. But again, we're always working with a spectrum in conflict, right? So we might not be on the total extreme side of being in fear. But our bodies might start to tell us what fear is wanting to communicate to us, but that we might need to take signal to be safe. So here we have two brains on the screen. The first one is low emotion, calm, relaxed. You can see this higher cortex in blue in the brain points to the fact that we have access to that, right? We have access to all of our critical faculty, all of our rational thinking all of the thinking that tells us we need to lock our door when we leave our apartment or our house, whatever it is. On the right side where we have a red brain is when our amygdala is in hijack now. And again, anywhere on the spectrum, we can inch close to that. So this is actually where our critical faculty is disabled. And when I say critical faculty, I mean our ability to think rationally along with all of our other higher functions. So to use that same example, in a rush, maybe I'm late for work or I'm you know, late for an exam, whatever it is, I might forget to lock my door, leaving my apartment. If we use that example in relations, you can see underneath anger, fear, excitement, love, hate, disgust, frustration. These are all intense emotions, right? And so we'll, again, we'll have our own experience to difficult conversations, relations, whatever it is. But these are indicators that we might be in a difficult fill in the blank and we'll use conversation today. So diving, diving deep in that a little bit further, if we're using our own personal landscape as an example, difficult conversations can, not always, but can be a mirror to our memories. And this is a little bit to digest, so we'll stick with this for a second. So what you see in front of you is called the iceberg. This is a classic example of um, what often is studied in psychology. I studied it in conflict. It's, it's everywhere. And so what it does is it shows us that often what we see on the surface is not always an indicator of what's going on. So above the, the water, we have the events. So your difficult conversation might be the event. Below the water, starts to tap into our subconscious being. And I, I mean, there's a lot to go through here and with 15 minutes, I'm not gonna take all of our time to do so, 
But what's important is the very bottom um, of the iceberg where it says mental models. So what values, assumptions, and beliefs shape this experience? So actually, we're talking about your perception in this experience. So the event is what's visible. What is invisible is your subconscious belief or your bias about what is happening. And to access or to make conversations that are difficult, the gateway to more harmony and peace is to look at what those mental models are, what those subconscious beliefs are that are influencing our experience. Whoops. I just lost my PowerPoint, so I'm just going to bring it back one second. All right. For some reason, it stopped sharing. I've got it here. Can you see that there? Great. So, um, so what we're doing is we're interested in what the mental models are that are informing those beliefs. So instead of being, you know, instead of, instead of being critical about it and realizing that, you know, we all have mental models and we all have bias, what we're looking to do is we're actually looking to nurture them. So in front of you is a picture of a woman watering a tree into the ground. And so I'd like to offer you to take this idea for yourself and instead of, instead of feeling overwhelmed with realizing that you know, bias is informing our beliefs, I'd like for you to be encouraged to embrace those beliefs, embrace those stories that are, and we're gonna talk through the how-to steps, so don't feel too overwhelmed about this now, but what I'm encourage, encouraging you to do is sort of an overarching idea is recognize that all of us are walking around with subconscious beliefs about what's happening in our relationships, and they're all unique to our own experience. You know, our own memories through childhood, our own memories through informative years when, you know, experiences led us to snap conclusions. Those conclusions are what are informing our ex current experiences until we undo them. So nurture those beliefs and we'll start to talk about how we can do that. First things first is safety. So when we're dealing with what are raising emotions or high emotions, what we want to do is ensure that we are safe. And as you remember from those two different brains, when we are in the blue brain feeling more calm, we're able to more rationally think, we're able to use our critical faculty. So if we can get ourselves back to that place, navigating a difficult conversation comes much easier. So there are a few ways, there's actually many ways to do this. These are some of the ways that come to me most naturally through practice, um, but certainly you will have some tools of your own and these just might give you some, some ideas. So, one would be to feel the ground underneath you. So when you're in the heat of that difficult conversation and you can feel yourself tensing up, one of the quickest ways to ground yourself and to restore that feeling of safety is to root yourself to the ground. Root to the ground. As soon as you can feel your feet touching the ground, whatever way that is, maybe you're sitting, maybe you're standing, sink into that further. Sit in further. Allow the, allow the ground to harness your safety. Another one would be regulate your breath. So what we often do when we're feeling tense is our body just stops breathing. A lot of us do this on a regular basis and we don't even know it. It's not until we're prompted to breathe again that we actually realize like, oh, I wasn't even breathing. Or the, more, the other common one is taking shallow breaths, right? So we might just shallow breathing, but we're not fully oxygenating and we're not fully releasing either. So three regular breaths can restore that feeling of safe and calm. So with that breath, notice where breath is creating space in your body. So another thing that happens in our bodies when we're feeling scared is to, is to let our body sort of tense up and we feel like there's no open space. So where we can breathe in more space, notice where that space lands and allow that space to expand just by focusing on it. Um, following it and focusing on it will give you more room. So if you can, the other option is to notice where you have a space in your environment that is warm. So if you can divert your eyes or if you happen to already notice the space in your environment where 
you feel safe or where you think it's a nice image or light. Maybe the light is hitting the wall or a flower in the room in a certain way. Or maybe your chair is particularly cozy, or maybe there's a coffee mug. Coffee mugs often symbolize safety because you know it's cozy and warm. Whatever it is, bring your awareness to that and you'll restore that sense of safety faster. Heal with your hands. So if it's socially appropriate, I mean, it's not always, but if it's not awkward, you know, if you can put your hand on your leg, or if you can put your hand, rest your hand on your arm, wherever you feel like your hand would comfort you in a you know, socially casual way, bring that hand as a healing mechanism to make you feel more safe. All of these things are just starting to lower, to sort of return our nervous system back to calm. The next one would be to um, do a curiosity audit. So when we talked about those mental models, those internal biases that we have, um, we're wondering, where do I feel unsafe here? So we might not be conscious of it, but in the back of our mind, there's a story populating about what's happening. It's our story. It's our perception. And it might be true to what's happening, but it might also have some flavors in it that you shared with it that aren't true, or they are true. We're just getting curious. So getting curious about where you feel unsafe and then what is it that story that you're telling about what's happening right now it's important to honor that what you feel and what you're experiencing is valid i'm just going to offer that to you there's no experience that's invalid it's your experience so we're not trying to do away with that here but we're just trying to meet ourselves where we are to recognize that this is our experience so that we can connect it with the person that we're in an experience with Asking where do I have evidence that my story is true can be a fun, humorous game to play with ourselves. So when we have that sort of running dialogue of what's going on and then we actually start to look for it, it might be easy to find because we're telling ourselves that it's happening. But when we dig a little bit deeper, we might realize that it's our narrative. We're, we're the playwright of our own play. So this is just helping us sort of sift, right? We're sifting for what is real and what is perceived. Um, the last question is, what can I do to change it? And it's totally fine if you don't have anything in mind. It's totally fine if no answer comes to mind because you might not feel like you can and that's totally valid as well. But if you are at a point at this stage where you can recognize that you are a playwright to some extent in this story, you might feel yourself shifting a little bit. Um, Colin, my friend that I mentioned earlier, um, founder of Stillness Labs, he likes to say, that judgment and curiosity cannot live in the same space. So judgment and curiosity cannot live in the same space. So what that means is that curiosity expands us and it opens us up to other realities, whereas judgment confines us to sort of a conviction about what's happening. Um, and where curiosity lives, so does expansion, right? So we're looking to expand our ideas. Um, I've used the example before of with an original photo, it, you know, so you've taken a photo on your phone and some of us like to go in and we like to edit the photo, put a different frame on it or a different filter on it, cut out, you know, whatever it is that we want to sort of cut out. Well, curiosity puts us back in the original photo, right? So the frame might hinder, it might, black and white is a great example, it might take out some of what's in the photo, that might be a judgment but the original photo might have the most access to the information that's in front of us. So this is doing sort of a curiosity audit. Honor what is right for you. So this would be sort of a third step if we're working in sequence here. Um, and there's a little, a little picture there, you know, told you so sincerely your intuition. So for those of us who can, who can relate to that, I certainly know I can. Um, what I, if I were to have any regrets about previous conversations where that were difficult, it might be that I wasn't honoring what was true for me and my intuition. Um, so really getting clear with yourself, what do you need from this conversation? It might be to feel safe. It might be um, a decision. It might be validation. It might be whatever it is, you have the answer. But asking that, getting clear on that answer might, might help you move forward. Then you might want something from the conversation. Right, so need and want being different things, 
But if you can get clear on what you need and want from the conversation, you can start to progress with it in a way that helps you um, and the other person as well. But we'll get to that in a second. So how do you want to feel after this conversation is over? That's another great question to, to pulse. And you might not need to know exactly what that is, but even that feeling, if you can think of that um, red and blue brain, whatever that calm blue brain is for you, you might want to feel that way. In an ideal world, we're consistent, right? We're never, we're in an ideal world, we're never feeling hijacked. I know that's not the reality, but, but that might be how you want to feel. And that's okay too. So look for the diamond in your conversation. So this would be step four. Um, so, this, so this phrase, a diamond is a chunk of coal that did well under pressure. So I like to believe that in every conflict, there's a diamond. And conflict can be transformative and helpful. Um, and in, in making it that way, what we want to do is we want to create rapport with the person we're in a difficult conversation with, right? So, you know, we can always look for the good. So starting with what is good in yourself. What is good about this right now? If you can, even if you have like an inch of curiosity, that's good. If you can look for that in the other person, you want to start to do the same. This is putting you in service. Being in service is one of the quickest ways to progressing a conflict. Um, acknowledging anything that creates harmony casually. So I'm actually verbalizing this now. Um, you know, it might be that I suggest like, oh, I really love, I really love that you brought that up because that's important to me as well. Or I really appreciate that you're asking these questions because, you know, it's important to me that we both have a shared understanding of what's going on. And also that we both feel like we can come out of this calm, centered, and happy with the decision or happy with how we collaborated. Whatever is good, even if it's small, it goes a long way. Um, doing mediation work, it's one of the quickest ways to get people to come to a resolve because if they start to hear that someone else is thinking positive things about them, they want to do the same. Harmony is more natural than competition, I believe. So communicate with skillful truth. This one's a little nuanced. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share more on this in a second. So leading with curiosity, as um, you've already done for yourself in an earlier slide, as you saw, now you're gonna do that for the other person. So again, putting you in service, asking the questions that will make them feel like you're concerned and um, putting their well-being first, or alongside yours, we'll say. So ask, what is true and important for them? So bringing your truth forward, um, Thich Nhat Hanh says, speak the truth, but not to punish, right? So we can be authentic. This, there's a lot of conversations around you know, well, if we're authentic, then it's going to be offensive or it's going to cause more conflict or aggravation. It doesn't have to. Um, and as you can see, Buddha says, when words are both true and kind, they can change the world. So we're not doing away with our power. We're not doing away with our authenticity or our truth. What we're doing is we're sharing it in a way that is harmonious and authentic and in integrity to nature, which is our intuition, and also the other person's integrity and their nature. Um, and I, I think that a repeat of these steps will, will be a good remedy for getting you as close as you possibly can to whatever it is that you're looking to, to achieve, right? Whether it's for sure that calm state, but you know, whether it's a negotiation or, um, or you're in a difficult conversation, there was a miscommunication, a misunderstanding. Jervis Bush is um, a professor at Simon Fraser University and I've done some studying with him um, and what he says in his research is actually that 80% um, of what we perceive to be conflicts are truly our own perceptions of a conflict. So there are conflict from within that side. So if we think of that story that we're telling ourselves, those mental models, 80% of conflicts that we think actually exist are just those. That's a high number, a high number. And so 20% are the real, you have a difference, right? A difference between reality and expectations. And we want to work with those. And we want to use conflict in a way that's healthy and good, and it's possible. Um, but I think the first step overarchingly, if I can offer any sort of last thoughts to emo emotional resilience, is to recognize that there is a lot happening internally in our inner landscape as we enter in. Um, and what we participate in participates in us. 
So if we want to participate in meaningful, purposeful dialogue, um, it's absolutely possible to expand with the yellow, the yellow rubber band, our emotional resilience to, to get through it in a way that's um, healthy. Wow. <laughs> we only have five minutes left, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it was so I didn't want to interrupt but it because you know we really wanted time for questions but that was I've I've written all sorts of notes so I'm going to just jump right in with some questions because I sure. think there's a couple of questions here that are along the same themes of what you you've kind of just summarized and so you know overall you know how the, the, some of the questions that are surfacing are, you know, how do you have a difficult conversation with the other when the other person is not calm? So they may be rude and yelling, or they may be crying or um, refusing to speak like the, you know, when you can do all of this stuff for you. But what about when the other person is, like I say, whether it's the, you know, some of the attendees have said rude, yelling, curled up, crying, jumping to conclusions, refusing to speak. You yeah. know, what, what recommendations do you have around, around that? So how you show up to a conflict informs your experience of it. And I would say also others' experiences of it. So getting clear on what integrity looks like for you. Um, in those cases honestly sound like the other person's not ready to engage. And yeah. if it were me showing up, in that conflict, I would, and I have, I have been in those situations, you know, you can react, it's easy to lash out and it's easy to meet their level, but we always want to lower, we always want to reduce that high emotion. So if we can sense, if we have the awareness to sense that someone else is doing any of those things that you just listed, we also have the awareness to, and I would also argue the irresponsibility to encourage them to show up to the conversation in a state that they would be calm. So you might say things like, I can see that this is a really important topic for you. I can see that it's something you care about. I can see that it's something, um, not making any assumptions a little bit, because you have to acknowledge where they're at, but none that would be judgmental. Any that come from the place of curiosity, can you let me know, what can I do for you so that we can talk about this in a way that you're going to feel good about it? Yeah, um, yeah. That's, and it would be that just encourages them. Yeah, I, I think sometimes, Erica, we, we, we feel because we're in the conversation, we're in the midst, we feel we have to have the conversation now. And so even if the other person isn't ready, and sometimes it's silence, I find a lot of people want to fill the airspace. Yes. <laughs> so they just keep talking. Yeah. And, you know, while the other person is perhaps trying to get control of their emotions or any of that sort of stuff. So giving ourselves, sounds like what you're saying is giving ourselves permission to not engage and to kind of, you know, do what we can, but then to actually maybe even walk away if we, if we have to. Yes, there's something called reflection in action. <clears throat> and what it simply means is what you just described. So in the moment, you know, we often respond, we often listen to respond, um, yeah. but listening to listen yeah. and then respond gives us that little bit of extra space to actually make a pulse of what our authentic selves would right. want to be a part of. Right, right. And it probably, it invites them to do the same. Yeah, yeah. And would you say the, the same thing? We've got another question that I think is on the similar vein. If the relationship is unbalanced, like a supervisor to, um, to subordinate or a, a practicum student on a practicum where there really is a power imbalance, would the same techniques apply? I think they should. Yeah. Um, you know, I know as a professor myself, I wish um, more students would I know it's hard because of that power imbalance. Yeah. Um, I think in power imbalances, there's, I think there's more responsibility on the professor or any, you know, whoever has perceived more power. I think there's more responsibility to create a space where students feel like they can share. Yeah. Um, but with that also make sure that, um, that, yeah, so helpful conversations can still, um, sorry, my screen just stopped sharing there, but yeah, so That's helpful okay. conversations can still be had. Um, so, I, you know, we all have power. Power is just the ability to create an act. And where power imbalances exist, um, you know, sure, it's, it's more difficult, but you, there's always a way, right? There's always something you can do to have a, cre a purposeful, meaningful conversation. Right. So and I'm really conscious of time and we've got so many yeah. questions. Yes. Um, Jervis Bush, the, the gentleman at Simon Fraser, how would you spell his name? 
Uh, G-E-R-V-A-S-E, uh, and Bush is B-U-S-C-H-E. I can send that information as well. Okay. I just don't know where to send it, right? Because we've got all these people on, oh, on, right. uh, on the call. Yeah. So, so uh, Clear Leadership I, is his book. It might be easier to find it. By what's it called? Clear Leadership. Clear Leadership, Jervis Bush. So, you know, if you Google it, something will, will um, come up for sure. Um, does gender play a role in this, Erica? Or how much does gender play a role? Oh, that's, yes, absolutely. That's a loaded question for like 30 <laughs> seconds left, right? <laughs> the short answer is yes. The long answer is you can email me after or find me on one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think this summary that we should probably send out to all of our um, attendees today is, will you come back, Erica? <laughs> yes, we'd love to. We'd love oh, to. We might have to do an emotional resilience, uh, bu building emotional resilience in difficult conversations part two. Because we'd love to. We had well over 200 attendees today. And um, it seemed like it was going to be a little quiet. But I tell you, you came to the end and the questions just are not stopping. And we've oh, had lots great. of of um of thank you so much and that this was great information so lots of really positive feedback but like i say a lot of um definitely a lot of, of questions that i think would be interesting to to answer so everybody we we we're sorry we ran out of time i really didn't i think the questions are important but i really didn't want us to, to stop and interrupt erica so we will have her back watch for uh watch for the announcements that we'll have we'll try to have erica back sooner rather than later to kind of continue on this conversation, Erica, because I think it's, um, we've, like I say, we've got some really, um, really fantastic questions that it would be, it would be nice to have you back. If I would love to, and I'm sorry I went over time. No, no, that's okay. I think it was really useful information. And don't forget everybody that the, um, yeah, we're getting, please do part two. Um, oh. Don't forget that the recording will be available and um, you can always reach out to us here at the Student Success Unit. And um, I've said that, that the PowerPoint won't be available, but it's possible Erica would be willing to share it. But the recording yes. will be available, so you'll be able to, to see the PowerPoint again and, and listen to, um, uh, to Erica to speak again. So Erica, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I'll, I'll chat at you later for when we can book a part two, because you are in demand. Oh. And everybody, please enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a fantastic weekend. And thanks so much for joining us on uh, today's Ask an Expert, and I will see you all next week. Thanks, thank thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.